Welcome to The Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. We are back again. Yes, good to be back. This is our series of author spotlights where we introduce you to an author, their history, their work, and of course, ask them your questions as well as ours. But first, we're going to start out with eight things you should know about Mary Robinette Cole. Mary Robinette Cole is a Hugo Award-winning author and professional puppeteer, and as a voice actor, has narrated books by Cage Baker, Cory Doctorow, and John Scalzi, among others. She has also met Sting. Hate her, love her, or fear her, but do not underestimate her. Nobody hates Mary, Tom. God, why would anyone hate Mary? Jeez. Her novels, while fantasy, are set in the Regency period, similar to the novels of Jane Austen. She created a Jane Austen spellcheck dictionary to catch words that might not be period appropriate. She has a list of words that didn't make the cut on her website at maryrobinettcoel.com. Her first novel was Shades of Milk and Honey, which was nominated for the 2010 Nebula Award for Best Novel. She won the Campbell Award for Best New Writer in 2008. Her short story, For Want of a Nail, won the Hugo Award for Short Story in 2011. Mary was born in Raleigh, North Carolina, and lives in the mythical city of Chicago, which of course, as John Hodgman has taught us, doesn't exist, so therefore, Mary doesn't really exist, so please see your doctor if side effects of seeing Mary Robinette Cowell persist. I saw my doctor for that. Mm -hmm. Mary's puppet designs have garnered two Unima USA citations of excellence. That's the highest award an American puppeteer can achieve. She once told Patrick Rothfuss that the Muppet she has the greatest emotional connection with is Ernie. She may have convinced author Sam Sykes to spend $75 on very elegant handcrafted letterpress printed calling cards that say elf butts. Elf butts. She might have convinced me that too. Elf butts. Mary was once vice president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association. She was removed in a coup by Rachel Swirsky, who is reported to have convinced Cole's vice presidential spirit to continue to be summoned for advice. Her latest book, Without a Summer, came out in April 2013. The cold mongers in Without a Summer were inspired by the Luddites. She is currently working on Of Noble Family. Now we know the basics, but what makes Mary Robinette Cole tick? Let's get a little more insight from Aaron in our whiteboard. Of all the authors being covered this season, this is the one which got Mr. Puppet most excited. Mary Robinette Cowell cut her entertainment teeth as an award-winning puppeteer on shows like Lazy Town and stage adaptations of works by Tolkien and Neil Gaiman, all of which, Uncanny Valley aside, makes for fabulous training for a career in speculative fiction. It shouldn't surprise. A novel is, amongst other things, a supreme act of puppetry, with the author responsible for animating the characters, the scenery, and the great globe itself. It's a daunting prospect, but one Cowell handles brilliantly by grounding her most popular works in the roots of the genre. There's little arguing that both the romance and spec fic markets are being dominated by the urban paranormal revival. But before that, the subgenre of choice for romance was the Regency. That makes sense, and sensibility, haha, <laughs> because Jane Austen framed the romance as much as Tolkien did epic fantasy. It's like the genre was just waiting for someone to remember this and inject the paranormal into the Regency setting, and not in the one-shot joke way of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. The result is, like Austen's work, eminently humanistic. The spellcraft serves literal and metaphoric ends, but the emotional focus is on the characters, empathetic stand-ins for exploring human motivation and behavior, not coincidentally like puppets. Plus, her last name sounds like something Batman would wear. Cowl. It's like towel, but cooler. My wife says I'm childish. What do you think, Mr. Puppet? That was fantastic, though. Do we do we tease him a little bit about well, the pronunciation? I don't know. He makes such a good point about Batman. Maybe she should consider alternate alternate pro pronunciations for for Batman jokes yeah. specifically. I like that he has a puppet in there. I, I do too. That's pretty cool. All right. Enough talking about Mary Robinette Cole behind her back. Let's see what she thinks about all this. Yes, we are happy to have Mary Robinette Cole with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, I'm delighted to be here. And, so. you know, I'll think about the cowl thing. <laughs> just for Batman jokes or just in Just general? for Batman jokes. Okay, okay. Yeah, just limited use. That might, might yeah. be worse. Well, know. you know, also epic fantasy jokes, because you can have a cowl oh, yeah. with that. That's a good point. Sure. Right. All right. Yeah, so we'll make some excuses for Aaron. I <laughs> Look think what Aaron fair. has done. <laughs> <laughs> He's changing all of our lives. Um, but tell us a little bit about Without a Summer. Right, so Without a Summer is set in 1816, which was historically called The Year Without a Summer. It's a historical fantasy. So my main characters are professional glamorists, which means basically that they can pull light out of the ether and uh, create illusions with it. And um, they can also, you can cool things a little bit with 
glamour, but not you can't freeze things. But there's a specific type of glamour called cold mongering, and people are blaming the cold mongers for the climate change, even though that is scientifically completely uh, completely false. As you know, assuming of course that magic works. So there's a magic system, but then there's also climate change. There's climate change, and so it's basically it's a really a political thriller. A courtroom drama that is masquerading as a Regency romance. Love it. With magic. That is the best of both worlds, actually. <laughs> uh, and you and there's get... a there's a metaphor for the Luddites in here. And as yes, um, you have the actual Luddites, but then the cold mongers are also serving as a, a metaphor for the Luddites. One of the interesting things that I found when I was looking into this and, and researching it was that I'd always thought Luddites as just having a fear of technology, but it was really a fear of, um, or a resistance to people changing the way the world worked. The Luddites were primarily upset about the weaving frames, and that's because, historically speaking, uh, you wove at home. It was a family thing, everybody was weaving, you know, and you didn't have to have outside the home childcare because everybody was at home. And as soon as the weaving frames came in, it became something you had to do outside the home. It became something that unskilled laborers could do and you had to have childcare. So it was a major disruption of life. And that's what they were upset about, not the technology itself. That's really interesting because it, it kind of fits in really well with today because now we're mm -hmm. talking about how technology is disruptive of home life and, and oh, hold relationships. Hold on, I have to take this. Yeah, thanks. Right. Yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> real nice. So that's interesting how that kind of comes into play. Yeah, one of the things that you hear all the time is history repeats itself, and when you're writing historical fantasy, it is oh so true that huh. it, it just constantly I'm reading things and going, oh look, and we're going through this again. Now, Valor and Vanity is out in April. You're busy. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Valor and Vanity we have described as Jane Austen writes Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> nice. So it's set in 1817. It's in Venice. And the thing that I am really excited about with this is that in Venice in 1817, Lord Byron was there. Mm -hmm. So this is a heist novel with Lord Byron. Lord and... Byron as the Rat Pack, kind of. Is, is that right? Yeah, basically. He was, I love he was that. the bad boy. Uh, Carolyn Lamb called him mad, bad, and dangerous to know. <laughs> and you start reading his letters and you're like, oh yeah, and also totally why all the ladies and men were completely hot for him. I like how instead of, in, 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 it's, it's Venice, not Vegas. I kind of like yeah. it. <laughs> Venice, baby. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you can make some totally works. There you go. I made you a joke. Um, we, have a, <laughs> we have a ton of listener questions uh, for you today. The first one comes from Sandy, and uh, she wants to know, I would love to know her time management secrets. How does one juggle writing, audiobook narration, and puppetry? So there is a lot of keeping a very tight spotlight so that people cannot see all of the balls that are on the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, I spend a lot of time doing what I call structured procrastination, which means that I will work on something until I hit a wall with it, and then I will switch over to something else. A lot of times, things like puppet building uh, don't involve the storytelling part of my brain. So I can switch over to doing some puppet construction and let the story keep churning. Likewise, when I'm doing audio narration, I'm thinking I'm, I'm basically just reading somebody else's work so it is, again, it's engaging the performance part of my brain, but not the storytelling part. And I find that often when I get back to the hotel room, I will have figured out the solution to a problem while I've been sitting in the booth. That, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. actually. You're just, you're just um, sharing out parts of your brain and letting, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and doing yeah. recharging. That's really good. Uh, Trike wants to know, clearly people like Jane Austen, uh, as we know, influence your books, but which writer do you count as an influence that would surprise us? Which, ooh, that is a good question. Um, probably Myrtle Reed, and she would surprise you because you've never heard of her. She was a uh, 1907 uh, romance author, and the thing that she did, which was for me just astonishing, was she, I mean, she was really, she is where the term purple prose comes from. So this is not anything about a, a language level, but her ability to write characters that you could really connect to and showing their internal motivations and using the internal motivation to make us understand why someone would make something that would seem like an extreme choice. So she, she, I find her absolutely wonderful. 
Um, so I, I read a lot of romance novels for my other book club, Vaginal Fantasy, and I'm, I'm curious to know what a romance novel from 1907 is like as compared to something that we would read today. It's very much the same structure. It hasn't actually changed that much. It's two people who shouldn't get to be together for various reasons. They struggle against those reasons, and then they get hitched. A lot of sexy times? Any sexy times? Or is it well, too, too soon? It, Ankles. The, the, the sexy fun to, it's funny because that you say that because there's uh, you'll see the phrase he made love to her all the time but at the time it just meant he he said fancy words to her ah. that, oh. was, he sweet talked that would be confusing in this context yes, <laughs> yes. i'd be like that wow they're really making love a lot the hilarious like, misunderstanding they're just yeah. in public like on the oh, carriage no 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 you would not make love in public no, well, oh, you wouldn't even talk about, like, wait, which no, no, no. Wh which make love are we talking about now? Either. Both of them, actually. Either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's move on. That's a discussion for a different day. Um, Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy says, so Mary has recently signed a three-book deal, uh, one of the books being the fifth in the Glamorous series that we spoke about earlier, um, but I was wondering if she could tell us more about the other two books. More specifically, what genre will they be? Uh, will she continue writing historical fiction, or will you move more into science fiction, like some of your short stories? Well, both of the new books, uh, Stagecraft and Ghost Talkers, are historical fantasy. They are set in completely different uh, timelines than than the glamorous histories. Totally different magic systems, um, and they're they're both standalones. Um, Stagecraft is set in 1907, Nashville, Tennessee. It is a uh, political intrigue. It's set in vaudeville. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of uh, race and um, class issues, uh, but also because it's in the theater, there's some there's some good, clean family entertainment, um, and then and then stuff that is just really brutal because 1907 Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the other book, uh, Ghost Talkers, boy, both of these are depressing books. Um, <laughs> Actually, Stagecraft has a happy ending. Ghost Talkers is uh, World War I. Um, and this one is if the, uh, if the spiritualist movement worked exactly as advertised. So you can totally talk to the dead. And the British intelligence service imprints their soldiers so that when they go into battle, they are trained that you have to report in to the spirit corps, which is a group of mediums and uh, tell them how you died. So they're getting instant troop updates. Hmm. Oh, that's brilliant. They that's should really have cool. done that. They, sh they should have done <laughs> that. Totally. Yeah. You're assuming they didn't. Yeah, wow, well, exactly. They could still be classified, right? Right. It, it seems like your books are not drifting, but sort of going forward in time a little bit. Now we're up to World War One. Is that on purpose or, yes. you know? Yeah, okay. Um, so one of the things that happened when my agent and I were initially talking, because I, I do write all over the map, we are we are shopping a science fiction murder mystery right now. Cool. But uh, one of the things we felt was that if I jumped, I could either make sure that every book was totally different, or we could try to build the brand by staying in one time frame. And what seems to happen in science fiction and fantasy is that people want more of the same. So the idea that I had was that I would do a five book cycle with the glamorous histories, and then I would step out of that. I'd like to come back to them at some point, but there's a, I think you can only write about characters so long before they become walking bundles of PTSD. So the idea that I had was that I would try to um, help my readers segue into the idea that I am writing stuff besides just that. It's one of the reasons that sometimes I describe the books as um, you know, this one is Jane Austen plus a heist novel or plus a political thriller so that it's not, I'm keeping one thing familiar and then I'm bringing in something new. Oh, that's smart. It eases so, the transition, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping will happen. Uh, Steve wants to go back a little bit to talking about your many different projects. Uh, he says, you have so many fun creative outlets and professions. What is creativity? to you? Does it differ in each way, each way you express it, or are there common threads which show up? That's interesting. For me, I, I often tell people that it looks like I have a whole bunch of different jobs, but it's all storytelling. For me, it's all about communicating with an audience. Creativity, though, that's a bigger question. Um, creativity, I think, is really basically a, a lot of asking what if, and what if I do it differently? And for me, that is one of the things that drives me with 
puppetry, with science fiction, with all of my storytelling is, is wondering what happens. I think creativity is uh, uh, very closely linked to curiosity and to willing to experiment and, and also to fall flat on your face, which I do a fair bit. Jenny has a question about one of your other mediums that you work in. Uh, what tips do you have for podcasters? We could use those too. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so first of all, please turn off everything that makes noise in your house. Unplug your refrigerator, get into a quiet place. Um, realize that you do not have to get it right in one go. You can stop and start. Uh, when I am recording audiobooks, the longest I have ever gone without making a mistake, and this was a ridiculously long thing, was 13 minutes. Normally you make a mistake every couple of paragraphs. Um, so you just start and stop. If you're recording by yourself, um, mark it on the text that you've just do a slash next to the thing that you've stopped next to. Um, start back at whatever spot is clean for you and keep going. Usually it's starting back at the beginning of a sentence. I have a whole thing on my website about how to read aloud, um, which I will tweet at someone, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I could talk about this for days. Oh, but cool. Th those are three useful ones. Well, yeah, check out the website. We'll have that in the show notes Absolutely. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Tama Homey wants to know if you miss posting for SFF Audio. I do. Um, it was a lot of fun. I was reviewing audio fiction, and I, I really enjoyed that. At a certain point, the number of things that I had to do was getting to be too much. And also, as I started writing more, it became uh, a little bit trickier sometimes, I felt, to review books because sometimes, you know, there are politics involved. And mm. if you don't like something, it's, it, it feels stranger when, when, you are, uh, when you're a peer than when you're just a consumer. Yeah, and especially with your, with your work with the Science Fiction Writers Association, I imagine that would get a little sticky too. Yeah, maybe. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Our next question comes from Nancy, and this is more about the audio side of things. Um, I'm really curious about the audiobook recording process. Clearly, when she's recording her own books, she already knows what all the voices sound like. Uh, but what happens when she narrates someone else's audiobook? Is there a discussion with the author beforehand on what types of voices that he or she is looking for? Or do they just trust that the narrator will make the best choices? Um, I almost never get to talk to the author. So it's really looking at and interrogating the text and trying to figure it out from the text. And if it's not in the text, I just make it up. Um, I try to, the, the biggest driving thing is looking for ways to make sure the voices are distinct so that it is easy for the audience to tell who is speaking. Some authors I do get to talk to, Sean and McGuire, Mike Underwood, they, uh, because I know them through the writing side of my life, I just email them and say, hey, I need to talk to you about voice. My recommendation for any author who is um, who's doing this, you know, whose book is going to be made into audio, is to make sure that you tell everyone involved, your agent, your editor, the publisher, everyone, that you are available to the author. Because when I do get to talk to the author, it is so much better. And and I've had a number of authors that I haven't known that have made it very clear. Um, or who've reached out to me, and that makes a huge difference. Makes me wonder when you're talking about keeping the voices consistent, if you have a character that comes in maybe at very distant points during the story, do you have to go back and listen to yourself to make sure you're getting it right? Sometimes. Um, usually I only have to do that if, it's, uh, if they sh show up in one book and then not till the next book. When you're recording, it's over the course of like two or three days, uh, maybe four. So you can usually remember what you've done, and I make a note. Uh, Usually I have something that's called a key phrase that I use to get back into the voice. Um, so like uh, I have a voice that I do for Elizabeth Bear, Abby Irene, and, and that key phrase is front of the mouth. She speaks very quickly at the front of the mouth. Ah. And that reminds me. Um, there's another one that I do, which is rich Corinthian leather. And this reminds me to speak slow and seductively and make, make love to the words. <laughs> In the 1905s, never mind. Um, <laughs> Gord has a question I think a lot of us uh, would like to know. How does it feel being a more convincing Rothfi than Patrick Rothfuss himself? Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. All right. Yeah, she was a better Rothfi. Rub nice. it in, why don't you? So smug about that still. I, yeah, that was, uh, that was deeply, deeply satisfying. We should probably explain what that was all about because some yep. people might not know. That's true. So, <laughs> so go 
ahead. You you can do it. You do the honors. Well, you were in Rothfuss too. All right. Oh. So Patrick Rothfuss hadn't been. He he was officially on Twitter, but he hadn't been really been on Twitter. Like he had five different Twitter handles, but he wasn't using any of them. He had just acquired the Twitter handles, and so he thought it'd be really funny to get five of his friends to post as himself and then run a contest to see which one could be the most convincing Patrick. Of course, he was one of the Rothfi, that's what was dubbed the multiple <laughs> of Rothfuss, Rothfusses, a gaggle yes. of Rothfi. Um, and it was, it was me, it was Mary, uh, Kyla Caseby, and his assistant Amanda, and uh, Amber Benson. And um, by far, Mary trounced all of us. Like 48% of the vote out of like five or six people went to her. So she, she well killed done. it. Well done, yeah. Killed yeah. it. Yeah, the next closest person was Pat with 15%. I am, I am so smug. <laughs> <laughs> with, with good reason, absolutely. <laughs> all right, well, we have another question from Alex. Uh, he wants to know, uh, why do you write short fiction in addition to novels? Do you like it more? Are they more lucrative? Does it give you an outlet for new ideas without having to like commit on a novel length project? Um, and then he said, I'll shut up now and let you answer the darn question already. <laughs> Um, I write short fiction because I like reading short fiction. Uh, there, there's a thing that you can do in short fiction that is harder to do in, in novels, and that's the emotional punch. There's a theory called the Hollywood formula, which is that when you get to the end of the novel or a story, that you need to do three things, which is uh, solve the problem, defeat the villain, and uh, reconcile the viewpoint characters. And the closer together those things come, the bigger emotional punch. A short story by very definition those three things are going to have to come right on top of each other just because you are you're in such constrained quarters but short stories also allow you to really look at the at, at a decision point in someone's life at a crux point in in ways that novels don't novels are a long series of crux points so they they do different things it's kind of like saying you know well you watch youtube videos why do you go see movies right it's a good point yeah i do both you do both? Yeah. Do you, do you? I only watch YouTube videos. Really? I haven't seen That's a movie so since 2005. Not, really? No. You don't, not even at home? Not even at home. No, just YouTube videos. You're weird. Yeah. Uh, I have, so I have a question. <laughs> What's that? What did you that? say? I said there's so many kittens. <laughs> I know. There's just like endless kittens. That's Why true. would you ever watch a movie? It's a, a fair movie? point. If they made a movie called 12 Years a Kitten, I'd probably watch that. <laughs> I'm just saying. American Kitten Hustle? Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. I want to see that movie. I have a question. Do, do you agree? Do you agree with Jim C. Hines, who answered the question "What's funny in fiction?" with the answer "Puppets freaking out and blowing away other innocent puppets"? <laughs> um, often, that is that is hilarious. Uh, the only time I think that was not funny was in Meet the Feebles, mm. <laughs> um, which involved uses of fake fur that were really unspeakable. Uh, really. Literally, yeah. Yeah. All right, so now we have our, our super questions, which are uh, questions that we're asking a lot of our different authors that come on the show. And the first one for you is, what is your crutch word? So I have a crutch phrase, which is, it occurs to me. And I have to root that out. Uh, the other crutch word is, I have characters breathing a lot. Uh, it's, it's a thing you do in puppetry to express emotion. And so I have to go through and root out that body language and replace it with other things. Oh, that's really weird. What does that look like? What does that body language look like? Um, fortunately, I brought a puppet with me. Oh, oh did you? Lovely. Oh, well, yes. So, um, so the idea is focus indicates thought. What the puppet is looking at is what it's thinking about. And breath is how it expresses emotion. So... <sighs> uh <-huh. gasps> So those are all breaths. So, you know, when I have a character who sighs heavily, inhales sharply with fear, um, holds his breath with anxiety, at a certain point it's like, yeah, we, we understand that he's breathing. Right. And so I go through and, and say, you know, instead of he holds his breath with anxiety, he shifts his weight from one foot to the other mm. or something like that. He hyperventilates from breathing too much. Yes. That's another one you could do. <laughs> I'll use that. Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> no, it's all, you, you, she can have it, right? Yeah, she can have yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Which sci-fi or fantasy author would you most like to see as a puppet? <laughs> this is actually very, uh, very specific to you. I think we probably won't be asking a lot of other you, authors you never know, this question. Right? Uh, um, that is such a hard question because 
the thing about puppetry is that there is a certain amount of of this involved and so there's a limit to how many science fiction authors i would really ooh um may, maybe a rod puppet you know a nice long firm rod no mm. <laughs> that could also be awkward that could be uncomfortable um, so maybe I could talk about marionettes, you know, which one I wanted to string up. Mm. Uh, huh. Um, that could get political. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Body puppets, you know, where you fit the entire body inside. <laughs> hey, Patrick Rothfuss. There you I go. A body puppet for Patrick Rothfuss. Perfect. Oh, you he totally would be... were. <laughs> Excellent yeah, answer. And with the beard. Oh, my goodness. He would be a great puppet. <laughs> or isn't there just a little, a little of all of us in, in Patrick Rothfuss? Yeah. I think Probably yeah. a beard. Yeah. yeah. You know, Pat... That would be a great Fozzie Bear. He would. He is adorable and cuddly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've, yeah. we've talked a lot about Patrick Rothfuss in this interview. <laughs> he's going he's to get a big head. He's haunting our interview. Uh, but thank you so much, Mary, for chatting with us today. Really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, thank you. This was so much fun. And I'm so delighted to at least be virtually in the castle. Yes. We'll have to have you in, in person sometime, too. Yes, you can meet that. Lem, who is decidedly not a puppet. No, we're not. He's not. No, we, we decided to. She He's ruled. a living creature, Tom. Oh, of a course. Living, Sorry. Real creature. Dragon. My mistake. He's How dare real you? Real dragon, not puppet. How dare you? How would it? that happen? Hey, Without a Summer came out January 16th, and Valor and Vanity is out as of April 17th. All right, that's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there's lots. Join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com and subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, buddy. Bye. <laughs>